Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters. Bishop Michael Behringer here. I am so glad that you could tune in with us on this morning. I do bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My prayer for you is that everything God has for you will find you right now. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I pray that everything that pertaineth unto you will be blessed and the blessings of God are looking for you right now. Receive it in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over you, the sweet communion of the Holy Ghost in you and peace that passes all understanding around you. God bless you today. Again, thank you for tuning in. We have been in this study, How to Deal with Stress. We have been in the 14th chapter of the book of St. Matthew uh, completely. Now, this story about the death of John appears in all four gospels. And is the only story other than, and let me say that again, other than the crucifixion narrative that appears in all four gospels. The nativity of Christ did not appear in all four gospels. Uh, the rise of the resurrection of Lazarus didn't appear in all four gospels. Uh, Jesus' transfiguration did not appear in all four gospels, but this story does. It speaks to the fact of the importance of the story. Our supporting scripture uh, that I chose is in the book of Hebrews chapter number four, and we will turn there right quick. Hebrews chapter four and verses 14 through 16. I want to read that in your hearing. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I love that passage of scripture because it not only tells us that Jesus was very God, but also that he was very man and that he understands the things that we go through because he went through them. But when he went through them, he went through them sinless. And I thank God for Jesus who paid the price for my sins and that we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find help in a time of need because he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. The Holy Ghost that lives within us is making intercession from within because he knows the mind of God. He knows God's will for our life. And we don't always know what to pray for as we ought. So he makes intercession for us with moaning and groanings that cannot be uttered. But it is good to know that not only was Jesus very God, but he was also very man. We've taken all of our stories on stress from the 14th chapter of the book of St. Matthew because what it does, the, the 14th chapter of Matthew, I have dubbed it the second most stressful day in the life of Christ. Certainly the first most stressful day in his life would have been the crucifixion. And no right thinking person would argue that because the crucifixion of Christ had to be stressful. As a matter of fact, Luke tells us that his sweat was as great drops of blood falling to the ground. Amen. And he did that in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know the sin took place in the Garden of Eden. It is, it is as though he's returning to the scene of the crime and leaving his DNA at that scene. Another time, another story. But his day starts off with him hearing that his cousin, his forerunner, his spiritual soulmate, John the Baptist, had been beheaded by Herod. And John's disciples picked up the body of John, went and buried it, and came and told Jesus the tenderness of that that they came and told Jesus. We're not privy to whatever that conversation was about for the Bible does not tell us. But what we can rest assured of is that when they came and told Jesus, whatever he told them, they went away better than they got there before. It is an impossibility to bring your problem to the Lord and it not be uh, better than it was when you leave. So his day starts off with them telling him that, and they told him something else. They told him, and Herod thinks you're John the Baptist risen from the dead. In other words, your head ain't too safe either. But I think that what it did is it brought into fruition what Jesus has known all along, 
that the cross lied imminent in front of him. He knew that his time was drawing close and he wanted to get away. Certainly hearing that your cousin, certainly hearing that your forerunner, certainly hearing that someone who was your spiritual soulmate has been beheaded would make anybody, you know, I don't care who you are, it would have an effect on you. And so Jesus wants to get away. He wants to get away for one reason. He wants to get away to pray. We have studied that. But Jesus gets in a boat when he finds out about John and he heads out across the lake to Bethsaida. Now Bethsaida was a suburb of Capernaum where Jesus' ministry was headquarters. He oftentimes went into a mountain nearby there to pray. But when he gets in the boat to go over to the other side, the crowd figures out which way he's going and they run around the lake and they actually arrive there before he does and they're waiting on him. And when you need that downtime and when you need some time alone with God, yet the circumstances draw more out of you than you have to give. But Jesus was who he was. And when he gets to the other side, there were 5,000 men besides women and children waiting on him. One writer says this, it says that he had compassion on them. Another writer says that, that, that they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he healed their sick, he ministered to them, and then he fed 5,000 with a little boy's lunch. We have studied all of that. He told the disciples to pick up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Now in order to keep up with me in our study, you may have to, I'm taking it out of St. Matthew 14, but I'm also making comments from Mark chapter number six, John, I mean uh, Luke chapter number nine, and John chapter six. You have to read it in all four gospels to get a good grasp of what happened because each writer gives us different details. And so Jesus has sent his disciples away. He puts them in a boat and tells them to go to the other side of the lake and he will meet them there. And he goes up into a mountain and he prays. And I want to pick the story up right there. Stay with me today as we dissect this. Now, according to the book of St. Matthew, chapter number 14, we will start reading at verse number 21 after he fed the 5,000. And it reads thusly. And they had all eaten and uh, were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Now, so Jesus puts his disciples in the boat, the disciples who wanted to send everybody else away, he sends them away first. He gets, he goes to the multitude, they want to take him by force and make him king. They want to make him king predicated on the fact that he's able to feed them, heal them, minister to them, and God will never allow you to make him king under any conditions that are conditions that are not of the heart where we accept him in the free pardon of our sins as our Lord and Savior. And all of a sudden Jesus goes up into a mountain and he prays. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. This is, I told you before, that he was with them in the first evening from three in the afternoon to six in the evening. But the second evening started approximately 45 minutes later, but he was there alone. And that's what he had wanted to do all day, to get alone, that he could talk to the Father. It does not tell us what he talked to the Father about. Perhaps you can read St. John 17 and watch the progression of his prayer in order to get that. But we do know that he was facing stressful circumstances and he prays. He has sent the disciples across the lake. It is a seven mile journey. You have to read the book of St. John to find all that out. Now we are about to go into what St. John called his fifth sign. Now let me pause here so that I can tell you what I'm talking about. St. John gives seven signs that proves with infallible proof that Jesus was who he said he was. That's why theologians sometimes refer to the book of John as the book of signs. John also gives us seven I am's. If you take the time to study the seven signs and the seven I am's, you will see a 
picture that you will never forget. Now, so, so, so these signs worked on this wise. The first sign, according to John, was in St. John chapter number two. It was where Jesus turned water into wine. Now, when you deal with that sign, well, well, the second sign was in St. John chapter four. We'll come back to the first sign. The second sign was in St. John chapter four. That was the healing of the noble man's son. The third sign was in St. John chapter five. That's where he healed the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. The fourth sign was the feeding of the 5,000 and the fifth sign was Jesus walking on water. And all both of those signs is in St. John chapter six. The sixth sign is in St. John chapter nine and that's where he healed the man who had been blind from birth. And the seventh sign was the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, St. John chapter 11. It is an interesting study to study those signs and perhaps if you're looking for something to study, that will be excellent. Now let me tell you how that works. If you go to the first sign where Jesus went to the wedding at Cana of Galilee and they ran out of wine and he turned water to wine. The water that he used to turn the wine was the ceremonial water that the Jews used for washing. Now you, you, you're gonna have to do some study on your own because they were constantly washing themselves for ceremonial purposes. Even when you entered into the tabernacle in the Old Testament, you had to stop and wash before you even went in. And Jesus turns that water into to wine. The sign of that works this way. It was a ceremonial washing water where they had to wash themselves all the time, constantly, over and over. And Jesus turns it to wine. On the last night of his life, after finishing the Passover supper, he institutes the new supper, or what we call the Lord's Supper. And he takes the wine and says, this is my blood that is shed for you. And he gives it to them that they might drink it. In other words, when we are washed in the blood, it is a one-time thing. We don't have to constantly do what they had to do with the washing of water. Ooh, I thank God for the blood because it cleansed me once and for all. Under the old covenant, they had to wash over and over and over. But in the power of the blood, you only have to be washed one time. And Jesus is in this mountain playing, praying. And, and you can look up the other signs and, and, and they speak for themselves. But Jesus is in the mountain praying. He has sent the disciples to the other side, seven mile journey. They have went three and a half miles and they are in trouble. And it says this, now verse 25, we're going to read it. And the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. Now the fourth night is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. He had been with them that evening, which was between three in the afternoon and six in the evening. We know that he must have prayed six to seven, maybe as much as eight hours because that's how long he has been gone. At any rate, they are in trouble 12 hours after he feeds the 5,000, which was the fourth sign. He's going to walk on water, which is the fifth sign. That fifth sign means that the nature that he made, the, the, the earth, everything that's in nature, he had dominion over. Now, now, now listen carefully. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. And straightway Jesus spake unto them, and saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now they thought he was a spirit. And that's not the only time they thought that. Even when he got up from the dead, according to the Luke narrative, they thought when he showed up in the room that he was a spirit. He forever put that to rest. He said, do you have anything to eat here? And they gave him uh, broiled fish and honeycomb and, and he ate because ghosts don't eat. And he said, does a ghost have flesh and blood like I have? So he forever put that to rest. And as he comes walking on the water, they see him. They are in trouble, but when they see him on the water, a greater troubling took place inside them because they thought they saw a spirit. Now, in order for you to understand how they felt, the Jewish people had, shall we say, superstitions about the sea. They really did believe that Satan, now listen to me carefully, had a stronghold in the sea. That's why, now they had a reason for believing it because you know 75% of the time when you read about the sea in the Bible, it's in a negative aspect. That's why uh, they could go back to when Moses and the children of Israel, God opened up a way in the sea and they walked across and Pharaoh's army was drowned in the sea. 
That's why Jonah, they had that, that he said, throw me overboard. And Jonah was cast over into the sea and swallowed up by the fish. If you will recall, when Jesus was asleep on the boat, the sea started acting crazy. And they got him up, he calmed the sea, and even when he got to the other side and ran into the man in the Gadarenes, when he cast the demons out of him, the legion, they went into the swine. And where did the swine go? Into the sea. It says they ran violently into the sea and were drowned. As a matter of fact, when, when, when you get to the book of, of Revelation, I believe it's chapter number 21 and verse 1. I want to read it in your hearing. And when you get to the book of Revelation, Yes, it's 21 verse 1. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So far, so good. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. So far, so good. And there was no more sea. Now, that's interesting because even when you get to the other side and this is all over, there's not going to be any sea in heaven. So the Jewish people had superstitions about the sea. But at any rate, the disciples is on this boat and they're going in the direction that Jesus told them to go. They get three and a half miles and they aren't making any progress because the sea has reared up against them. Now, I give them credit for this because, now, 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 now listen, now listen, and when, now, now listen, fourth watch of the night, Jesus, uh, he went walking under them. That's in verse 25. But verse 24 says this. It says, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. Now listen, for the wind was contrary. That word there is indicative of the fact that the wind was blowing in their face. All they had to do to get out of this jam they were in is turn the boat around, put the wind at their back, and go back to where they started from. But Jesus had told them to go to the other side. You got to give them credit because what they were doing is they kept going in the direction that Jesus told them to go in. And that's what the enemy will do. You could almost bet you're headed in the right direction because when you're on your way, a storm blows up. What the enemy is trying to get you to do is turn around and go back the other way because he knows if you carry out the word of God, something powerful is going to happen on the other side or in your journey there. So he blows up a storm. Then you also must take into consideration that the whole birth of the New Testament church was on this boat. Now, so, so the enemy had tried that before, but Jesus was on the boat asleep and somebody woke him up. Now he has them on the boat by the themselves or so it seems and he's trying to take that boat under but they kept rowing in the direction that Jesus told them to go if you ever fool around and find out the direction that God wants you to go keep on going in that direction it does not matter how the wind blows it does not matter who does not like you it does not matter who talks about you keep going in the direction that you are going and Jesus comes down out of his prayer and all of a sudden he goes walking to them on the sea. And he says, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him saying, Lord, if it be thou bid me, now listen, come unto thee on the water. And he said unto him, or he said, come. Jesus gives Peter a wonderful invitation that we see through the Bible. He told, he, he, he told Noah, come on in the ark now. But Jesus says one word, come. Peter had received the word that the other disciples received to go to the other side of the lake. Now he receives a new word that was only for Peter. Jesus said, come. Now, you've got to know that the folk on the boat, now come on, stay with me. Even though the narrative didn't tell us, Peter is on this boat with the other disciples. Jesus says, come. Now, the Bible says that when Jesus said, come, and when Peter was come down out the ship, so Peter immediately responded to the word that Jesus has spoke to him. What do you think the other people on the boat said? Come on, Peter, what are you doing? Man, you can't walk on water. Are you crazy? You better stay here in the boat. You better stay where you at. Because if you get out there and something happen, we can't come and get you. Peter, what are you doing? Stay on the boat, man. But Jesus had said, come. Now, the problem becomes that when you are in the church and the whole church was on that boat, that there are times when people want to stay in a position of safety. 
And Peter is about to get off the boat and walk on water. Now here's the thing, because of the call in Peter's life, it was necessary for him, although he doesn't even know what that call is, Peter is going to be the first bishop of the New Testament church. Peter is going to be the first pastor of the New Testament church. Peter is going to preach the first sermon in the New Testament church. As a matter of fact, when Moses gave the law, 3,000 people died that day. When Peter preaches this first sermon, 3,000 people are going to be added to the church. That's in Acts 2. So you've got to understand that the call that Peter had on his life is what prompted him to step off the boat. But the people on the boat didn't have the same call on their life. So they could not understand what Peter was doing. Now, a lot me to fast forward for a minute because if you fast forward two weeks later Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi was the only province in the nation of Israel that when they came out of captivity they never went back to God. It wasn't a scribe, it wasn't a Pharisee, it, 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 it wasn't a Bible, it wasn't a, a Pentateuch, it was no word in Caesarea Philippi at all and Jesus takes them to Caesarea Philippi to announce the church. Now, why is he doing this? Now, here's what's interesting. For those two weeks between this event and them going to Caesarea Philippi, you are hard pressed to find what Peter said, but two things. So in other words, Peter was strangely silent for the next two weeks after this event. And they get to Caesarea Philippi and Jesus says to them, he says, who does man say that I, the son of man am? Now make no mistake about it. Jesus was in paradise. No, and he didn't need Prozac. He wasn't out of his mind because he said, who does man say that I, the son of man, am? He called himself the son of man. In other words, he knew who he was, whether other people knew it or not. And all the disciples had an answer for him. Somebody must have said, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Isaiah. Some say you got the sweet lullabies of Zephaniah. Some say you're like Moses. But everybody had an answer except for one person. Peter didn't say anything. And then Jesus cuts him off. He said, okay, past all that, who do you say I am? And, and nobody said anything, but Peter spoke up. And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. How did Peter know that? Peter didn't get that on the boat. He got that when he got off the boat. Peter didn't get that rocking in the, in the storm. Peter got that by stepping out on faith. And then Jesus tells Peter, oh, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. As a matter of fact, what you have been through denotes what you are going through. I, I, I remember a scripture, and, and I've been sick, and, and, and God God, God delivered me from my sickness. I had failed God and God delivered me from my failures. I had let God down and God kept me afloat. E even in Greater Love Christian Church, listen to me now, we gave funerals for free. The food was free, the preacher was free, the church paid the musicians, the people cleaned up the church and, 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 and several people came to me and said, we're gonna have to start charging them these funerals, we're spending too much money. As a matter of fact, you spend too much money giving people what you give them. And when people come to me and they say they're hungry, I'm gonna feed them. When people come to me and they got little children and they need certain things, I'm gonna see to it that they have them if I can. But here's what nobody noticed. Come on now, stay with me. The people who, who, who watch out for the money, they were simply doing their job. I take no quorums with them because they were absolutely right based on what they said. But when I was sick, laying on my sick bed, almost dead, God got me up. When I was in trouble, God I mean, he came in like a mighty Russian wind and got me up. God kept me when I wasn't even faithful to him. And one day in prayer, I asked God a question. I said, why have you favored me so much? And I dreamed that I was reading a scripture. The next morning, I got up, picked up my Bible, opened my Bible, and there it was. I mean, the scripture, and I just opened it and fell to this scripture. And it's in Psalms 41 and 1. And I know most people ain't never read this, but now listen to what it says. Blessed is he who considereth the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. And God had revealed to me that, that he, he delivered me because of what I was doing for him. We are the 
church. Now let's go back and get on this boat. We have to be careful to be who we say we are. Now, when you get back on the boat, Peter is getting off the boat. Now, now, now everybody had to be telling them, Peter, you out your mind, you need to stay on the boat. And when you think outside the boat, people don't always understand you. That's why I told you that story. When you get off the boat and do things that normal people wouldn't do, they don't always get who you are. They can't get it because they have not been where you've been, nor is the call that is on your life the same as the call that is on their life. And Peter says, Lord, if that is you, bid me to come unto you on the water. And Jesus says one word, come. And Peter steps out the boat and they are complaining. Peter, man, you need to be careful. Peter, look, man, you're getting all wet up. The water's all over you. But Peter noticed something that nobody else noticed. When he steps out the boat with that first foot, it didn't sink. And nobody else notices that. Peter steps out the boat on with his second foot. It did not sink. Yes, he's getting wet. Yes, the waves haven't went anywhere. The wind is still blowing. But Peter knows what nobody else knows, that my feet has not sunk. Because after all, Peter is going from being a fan to being a follower. And Peter is the quintessential of a text we always quote. Now, 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 now listen carefully, because the disciples will go Going by what they saw. They could clearly see the storm. They were going by the nature of the situation. Peter, you cannot walk. No man can walk on water. And Peter is understanding I might not be able to do it on my own, but he said, come and I'm going to where Jesus is. And because I know wherever he is, there's going to be joy. I know wherever he is, there's going to be peace. I don't want to stay on this boat listening to y'all whine and complain about the storm if he tells me to, I'm going to get out the boat and I'm going to walk on water. Because after all, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. And even though they were looking at what they were seeing up under Peter's feet was something he could believe in. Because even though my, my, my feet are getting wet, I'm not sinking. Even though the water is blowing all over my robe, I'm not sinking. And Peter is standing on water with one hand held onto the boat. Now, it's not actual faith until he can let the boat go. Sometimes we have to let our boat mentality go. Sometimes we have to let our church mentality, the way we've learned things go and let the Bible be true and all men's words be liars. And so Peter steps out of the boat and he is not sinking. This does not mean when Peter had that experience because when Jesus said, who does man say I the son of man am? Peter could say, oh, they might not know who you are, but I know who you are because I stood on water and had a conversation with you. A place where I should have went down, your word held me up. A place where I should have lost it all, I kept it all. A place where no man that I know could have survived had you not been who you are. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. It didn't make Peter a perfect man because later on when Jesus is a arrested and Peter's by the fire, he's going to say, I don't even know him three times. He's going to start cursing and swearing. But Jesus knew that was coming. He said, Peter, he said, listen, the, the, the devil desires to sift you as weak, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren, my water walking friend. In other words, based on, now come on, don't, 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 don't change channels on me. There are times when it's based on what you have been through that determines what you are going to. And the things that you go through is not designed for where you are. It is not designed for people to understand you, but it's designed to prepare you for where you're going. And Jesus tells Peter, he said, you are going to deny you know me three times before the rooster crow in the morning. But when you're converted, I want you to strengthen your brother and people who didn't do what you did. I want you to strengthen them because the devil desires to sift you like wheat. He knows Knows is something special about you so he has a target on your back. He has hung you up in his post office on his top 10 most wanted. Uh, uh, Philip wasn't in there but Peter was and Peter I'm telling you that you're going to make it through what you're getting ready to go through and I want you to strengthen your brother. He took the failure to strengthen people who didn't fail as bad as he did. 
So Peter steps off the boat. He's holding on to the side of the boat. It is not true faith until he can let the boat go. It is not true faith until he turns his back on the ones who is saying what he can't do and fix his eyes on Jesus, the one who says what he can do. Because you can do with Jesus what you can't do by yourself. You can do with Jesus what other people can't do for you. And Peter lets the boat go and he walks on water. Every Everybody talks about how Peter sunk, but the narrative is indicative of the fact that when Peter said, if it's you, bid me to come, and Jesus said, come, that Jesus stood right where he was because Peter said, let me come unto you walking on the water, and Jesus froze because that's what he, I've been looking for somebody who's willing to get out of the norm and do the incredible. I've been looking for somebody who knows who I am and who trusts me enough to know that I can take you where you can't take yourself. Come on, Peter. Get off the boat and walk on water then. Come on, Peter. Trust me. Just get off. Peter gets off the boat with all the naysayers. Peter is tired of rocking on the boat. He's tired of rowing and not going anywhere until the church is willing to get off the boat and come out the norm and do what seems to be impossible and can't be done. She will never live out the true meaning of her creed because if a church sits in a community, that church needs to look like the community it sits in. If there are drunks in the neighborhood, it'll be some drunks in church. If there are drug addicts in the neighborhood, it'll be some drug addicts in church. If there are drug dealers in the neighborhood, it'll be some drug dealers in church because they are there by invitation. We're so worried about what people are dealing with. We're so worried about who's straight and who's gay and, 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 and who's drinking and who's smoking. We're so worried about that that we miss the fact that God alone is a hospital for the hurting. Jesus Jesus said it himself, I did not come to call the righteous, I came to call the unrighteous. It's not the well that need the physician, it is the sick. And until the church comes out of those walls and she's willing to get off the boat and stand in places where other people will not stand until she can brave the storm and refuse to be denied. And if God gives you the, the word to come, then that gives you the power to get through what you're going through. And so Peter fastens his eyes on Jesus and suddenly he he lets the boat go. And when Jesus said, who does man say I am? Peter said nothing. He didn't care what they said. Who do you say I am? And, and Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, because I was on that boat and I stepped off. It was hard for me, Jesus. I had my moments, Jesus. I had times when I wasn't sure. I had people in my ear telling me not to do it. But from the moment that I looked at you, I knew that it was something special going on because my feet was not sinking. They were wet, but they didn't sink. I'm standing on water. Water. If I can stand here, I can let the boat go. And Peter lets the boat go and he walks on water. As he comes closer to Jesus, he's walking. He's looking at Jesus. Can you imagine how Jesus felt after all the stress he has been under? Here is somebody. Here is the man that is going to lead the New Testament church and he is walking on water and Peter gets right by Jesus and he starts looking around. I can tell you something when you start looking around and, and commercials go off in your head and things are distracting you. You are right by Jesus. You're in the place where you're about to be blessed and Peter starts to sink and he says Lord save me and Jesus reached down and pulls him up. Now for Jesus to reach down and pull him up. Peter had to walk from the boat to where Jesus was. If you're going to get in trouble, get in trouble going to the Lord because if you get in trouble doing what he told you to do, he gave Peter one word and Peter defied everything that we know as normal. He gave Peter one word and Peter walked in places where other people died. He gave Peter one word and his superstitions was put to rest. He gave Peter one word and it changed his life for the rest of his life. He gave Peter one word and Peter left everything behind that he knew to be real. He gave Peter one word and by faith Peter acted on that word. The storm tried to take him under but the word kept him up. 
Peter walked on one word. He did what could not be done without that word being given to him. And Jesus gives him one word, come. He's given us that word today. If we want this world to change, we got to come to him. Those who come to him must know that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you're thinking about me these days, pray for me as my life is taking a great turn. If you're thinking about me these days, pray for me as I'm about to move on to another level. If you're thinking about me these days, pray for me. I shall never forget what the woman Charlotte Franklin said. She was teaching Bible class one night and she said, make yourself so valuable to God that he can't afford to lose you. I went home and wrote that down because it resonated in the city of my soul. I shall never forget that word. What would happen if the church would make itself so valuable in the neighborhood it sits in that God can't afford to lose them? What people in the church didn't see is we were that valuable to God by having those funerals. When money ran out, a pro football player came in and made a donation. When the roof was leaking and the thing was falling in. I met a man in the store who told me, if you just go here, they got a foundation who will put a new roof on the church. When a man came to our church for a funeral, he noticed the parking lot needed paving and he paved it. When the money almost ran out, people who had never tithed before start tithing. Only God can do that. And until you see God in the midst of your storm and you're willing to walk on the water to get to him, you will not see the miracles that God has for you. God has a miracle in store for your life no matter what you're dealing with right now you may have to get off the boat and trust him enough to become a water walker but if you can't do that you can't be blessed because God we're out here I'm going in the direction that you told me to go everything is going wrong in my life I need to get to you and God says come but you got to get out of the boat you got to leave people who are telling you what you can't do I don't mean leave your house I don't mean leave your children. I don't mean leave your church. I'm talking about leave the mentality that you have what other people's opinion govern the way that you go. Listen, when I was born, people didn't care nothing about me and I got a feeling when I leave, most of them won't care nothing about me. But if I can be in with Jesus, don't none of the rest count. If I can be with the author and the finisher of my faith, if it takes me walking on water to get to the one that said, let not your heart be troubled. If it takes me walking on water to get to the one that said that, that, that those who come to me I will in no wise cast out. If it takes that to get to one who said take my yoke upon you and learn of me for my yoke is easy my burdens are light then you have to leave some things behind. Quit worrying about what you don't have. Concentrate on what you do have and get to Jesus at all costs. He told Peter come and he did not close the distance between him and Peter. He stood where he was because Peter said if as you bid me to come to you walk on the water and Jesus stood right where he was and Peter walked to him and when Peter started looking around how can you walk on water and sing how can you preach a great sermon and sing how can you sing like an angel and sing because that is the human equation but what I like about Jesus is he was right there to pull him up he said Peter why did you doubt you made it all the way here and you doubted we have came through too much now to doubt I have been through too much now to allow what other people say or think to keep me on the boat. I've been through too much now not to know that my God is an ever-present help in a time of trouble. I've been through too much now. And Peter, Peter walks on water. Peter ends up in the very presence of Jesus. And Jesus pulls him up and they stand. Now, 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 now you got to get this. They stand on water and they have a conversation. He is standing on water. The storm is still raging around him and they have a conversation. And the folk that are on the boat are straining to see Peter just like they strained to see Jesus because they wasn't sure who was out there. And when Peter started to sink, Jesus reaches down and pulls Peter up and they are standing on water having a conversation. The thing that's trying to take you under, God's going to give you preeminence of it and you will stand on it that other people will know that you are 
in the hand of Almighty God. It is not about you. It is not about me. It is about him. And Jesus pulls Peter up and they stand and have a conversation. And now the boat ain't no closer than it was before. The storm is still raging. And he and Peter are being held up by water. Why would the water hold them up? Now you got to get this. He, according to John, John wrote this. He said, in the beginning was the word, the word, the word, in the beginning was the word, the word, the word was with God, the word, in the beginning was the word, the word, the word was with God, the word was God, in the beginning was the word, the word, he was the word. Because if you go on down, it says, there was nothing made that wasn't made by him. So the water, nature, this is the, the fifth sign that John gives, that nature obeyed him. Yes, Peter has said it before, who is, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? And Peter and Jesus is standing on water and Jesus is talking to Peter and they walk back to the boat and the moment they get in the boat, the storm ceased. One writer said they were at their destination. In other words, the moment Jesus got back on the boat with them, they were already there. If you can get on board, you might have to walk on a storm or two to get there. If you can get on board, you might have to go places that other people won't go to get there. But if you can just get on board, with Jesus, everything else would be all right. Peter walked on water. Jesus had been praying. He knew they were in trouble. And I want to let you know that when Jesus gives you a word, go for it. Go for it. We're so busy staying safe on the boat. We're so busy worried about the right kind of people being in church. We're so busy worried about who's who and what's what. We're so busy worried about what other people will say about us if we get in trouble trying to do what we're trying to do. But I found out that the enemy will attack you when you mean business for God. I found out when you make up in your mind that you really want to do something supernatural, that it takes a supernatural God to get you there. I found out that, 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 that I have a protection propensity toward failure but I also have a propensity toward greatness and the two of them will run parallel and the difference between you and it is Jesus because if you can just get to Jesus he'll work everything else out if you can just get to Jesus he'll make a way out of no way if you can just get to Jesus he will. he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother if you can just get to Jesus but you may have to do something that other people don't think can be done in order to get there so I came to tell the church today that he still walks on your storms. I came to tell the church today that sometimes you have to come out of the norm and do what other people won't do now so you can do later what other people won't be able to do then. Peter is going to learn from his water walking experience. Peter is going to learn who he is not on the boat but in trouble. Peter's going to learn that if you go down doing what God told you to do, it is not your responsibility to pull you up. It is his. And God is a God of people who are willing to do what they can never do without him. And when Peter sunk, Jesus pulled him up. And he said, Peter, man, you made it all the way here and then all of a sudden you're going to have doubts. Peter, the mistake you made is you start looking around you. But what you need is already in you. Instead of looking on the outside, look on the inside because there is where the Holy Ghost is going to be in your life. He and Peter is having a conversation on water that will forever change Peter's life from a fan to a follower, from someone who doubted to someone who had faith, from someone of fear to someone of faith. Peter's life is never going to be the same. That's why for the next two weeks he was quiet. That's why for the next two weeks the man that couldn't shut up didn't say anything. That's why when they said, who does man say that I am? Peter didn't say a word, but when he said, who do you say I am? Peter said, oh, I know who you are. How did you know that, Peter? Because I stood in a place I shouldn't have made it. How do you know that, Peter? Because we had a conversation standing on water and the storm was still raging. And when I looked in his eyes for the second time, he kept me up. Now here's what's interesting. Yes,
Yes, Peter sunk, but when Jesus pulled him up, he looked unto Jesus, the author and finisher of his faith. Did it ever dawn on you that his sinking is where people leave him? Yes, he sunk, but he got up. If you are out there and you've sunk, go on and get up one more time. Try it one more time. If you are out there and you've been in tears, just try to laugh one more time. If you are out there and somebody threw you away, trust one more time. Just do it one more time because when Jesus pulls Peter up, Peter is looking at Jesus. They are having a conversation and now they're walking back to the boat. Now you got to get this. Jesus is talking to him. They're walking back to the boat, but the, the waves is holding them up. Peter is not looking at Jesus now. He had to look at him to get there. He went down when he took his eyes off of it. When Jesus pulled him up, they're standing face to face, having a conversation. Jesus increases his faith and now they're walking back to the boat, looking in the same direction of the boat. When you get with God, you get your change, your vision changes. You start looking in the same direction that he has for your life. And Peter's going to be the first pastor of the church. So Peter does what a pastor has to do. He gets off the boat and he goes to Jesus. And now they're walking back to the boat. Why isn't he sinking? Because when he went to Jesus, he had to keep his eyes on him. Why isn't he sinking? He's walking. They ain't looking face to face. When Jesus talked to him, standing there, they look face to face. Even though it don't tell us what he said, it doesn't tell us about that conversation. Come on, Peter. Let's go on over to the boat. Jesus, I, 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 I just want you to know, man, I, I thank you for this experience. You know, when you come out of something that should have killed you, you can say, I thank you for this experience. When you come out of something that other people didn't make it through, you ought to say, I thank you for this experience. When you've been through a bad time, when somebody threw you away, God has a better plan for you than what they had for you. And you can say, I thank you for this experience. When you have came through your tears, your fears, your nightmares, and you are still standing, when you have been in places that you didn't think you would ever recover from, and you are still standing, then you are a water walker. God, I thank you for this experience. When you can thank God for what you went through, because now you got it in your heart that you are going to something good greater than what you came from, you can say, I thank you for this experience. And Peter had an experience with him on water. The storm did not stop as they walked back. It stopped when they got back on the boat. When I come to church, you know, I feel better. When I have my water walking experience, I feel better. And everybody should have some experience with God where it's you and him alone. And what I like about it is when Peter started to sink, Jesus was right there pulling him up. So even though pe people give Peter a hard time about, about him sinking, and when you talk about Peter walking on water, the first thing people say is, yeah, he sunk. But he didn't sink on the way back. He sunk on the way out. If I can get through what I'm going through, when I come back, I'm going to be better. If I can get through what I'm going through, when I come back, I'm going to be stronger. If I can get through what I'm going through, when I come back, I'm going to be greater. My greater is later, not right now, for the battle is not yours. It is the Lord's. And once you have that face-to-face -face conversation with the Lord and you get through your storm and you break through to him, don't you quit praying until you get to him. Don't you quit worshiping until you get to him. Don't you quit praising until you get to him. Because once you get to the Lord, the rest of it don't matter. God, if I can just get to you through this, when we walk back, I'll be able to walk all by myself. So I want to encourage you that if you're going through a stressful time and the storm is still raging, get to the Lord at all costs. I, I want to encourage you. Don't turn back. Even if you sink and just holler out like Peter did, Lord, save me. And if you are in this, listening to this, and you've never given the Lord your heart, just say, Lord, save me. I believe that you are the author and finisher. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you got up from the dead. I need a savior. Lord, save me. Because when you cry out to God, all these former things and all the stuff that, that, that we do and all our rules and regulations makes me sick to my stomach. Because you want to know the truth. If you can just get out of your mouth, Lord, save me. He is faithful. Oh, he's faithful. If you can get out of your mouth, Lord, I repent. He is faithful. People won't forget you, but he is faithful. People will not remember the good you did, only the bad you did, but he is faithful. People remember that Peter sunk, but I remember that he got up. 
People remember that Peter got right to Jesus and went under, but I remember that he got out the boat and went over. And when he's walking back, he's walking with Jesus. One of my favorite songs when I was a kid was Walk With Me, Lord. Walk with me. Yeah, all along this tedious journey, I need Jesus to walk with me. And so today I want to encourage you that sometimes you have to get off your boat. Call to Jesus, say, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And he'll bring you straight to him. We have two more lessons in this series. But I want you to take from this one that even in his most stressful times, Jesus took the time out to see about somebody else. If your stress is stopping you from doing what God called you to do, then it's not the stress that's doing that. You're doing that and you need to say, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. I love you in the Lord. I have nothing but love for you. May the God of all grace bless you and keep you. May the Holy Ghost lead and guide you. And may perfect peace be all around you. And you are blessed. Look this week for a blessing to find you. In the name of Jesus, this is the week that a blessing will find you. Grace and peace, my beloved brothers and sisters. I love you in the Lord. Bye-bye.